Mr. Wells. Mr. Sanders. Dr. Sanders. Dr. Wells. Doctor, doctor of foods, uh, high science. Yes. Uh, what do you have for us today? Well, uh, I have a wonderful food heist that was sent in. It was not really a heist. It feels very smash and grabby. But okay. It was a food theft. Well, sent I mean, in by Gene mm-hmm. S. Okay. I promised I would start saying names, and then we decided that after we sent the police after the last guy, maybe we should uh, just uh, give initials. Yes. If you want your full name included then let me know when you submit to IBS at dragonsteel.com. Anyway, Gene S. sent this one to us, uh, and this happened uh, in Columbus, and this was July 9th. Okay. Just a couple of days ago. Okay. Three guys went into a store and stole $800 worth of candy. Okay. Yeah. So it's mm-hmm. just shoplifting. Shoplifting some candy. Oh, wait. No, this was June 13th. The article was posted on July 9th. Okay. So June 13th, last month. Uh, yeah. $800 worth of candy. Three dudes. So that's a really expensive pile of candy. Yeah. Like, I don't know if I could get up to $800 worth of candy. I don't know how much candy that is, like, by weight. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't say, the, the article's very short. It doesn't say, like, how they hid $800 worth of candy on their person. Yeah. Um... Did they, like, is there just some real, did, was it all Toblerones? Like, what's the most expensive candy? I don't know. I used to think Ferrero Rocher was super expensive because we only had it, like, at Christmas. It's very cheap. Hmm. Um, yeah. I, relatively I, cheap. Let's I guess say that. You said there's two two of these people. Three dudes. Three. Okay. That explains still, I think I would have trouble getting $270 worth of candy yeah. stuffed in my pockets. Like... That seems and there, there's like uh, security photos of them. They're just guys in hoodies, mm. and so they've got some pockets to work with. Maybe this is like maybe this is in like New York City where it was every, Columbus, Ohio. Oh, you said Columbus. Yeah, it's not mm-hmm. even not even a high cost of living where maybe. Yeah, I, I mean it's say, a big city. Yeah, but it's not an expensive city. Yeah, so I wouldn't ex- like they did. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, Adam, what's the most expensive candy? <laughs> Adam's looking. <laughs> He's going to Google that, and it's going to be like some... It's like, going to be some ridiculous like there's a gold-plated chocolate bar. In the Louvre. Le, le, in the Louvre. Louvre. Uh, there's a chocolate chocolatier in the Louvre that's yeah. pretty expensive because uh, we stopped by when we were at the mm-hmm. Louvre, and we're like, wow. It's like, you know, 50 bucks for four candies. Yeah. Um, so... But this was a... Store in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, they're like, not going to have Louvre chocolate. Now, it, like we've got some chocolatiers here mm-hmm. in uh, like Rocky Mountain Chocolate Company or whatever yeah. it's called that does like the big candy apples and stuff. Mm-hmm. Those are expensive. They are, but also hard to conceal in a hoodie. Yeah. So, I don't know. Uh, these guys aren't getting in food heist prison. I'll tell you that. <laughs> you you got to steal something cool, right? I mean. I think just the skill alone of concealing nah. $270 of candy if on they your person. had stolen only Toblerones, <laughs> that would be cool, right? <laughs> if they'd stolen only Blow Pops, that'd be even cooler because you're like, what are you going to do with $800 of Blow Pops, right? But just stuffing your pockets with whatever you can get, nah, you don't get to what go What if it's $800 of worth of Penny Candy Gummy Bears? I mean, that would be all right. That would be, mm-hmm. what, mm-hmm. 800,000 gummy bears? <laughs> that would be an incre- 80,000. 80,000 80, gummy, gummy bears. bears. Individual. See? Not even in bags. Mm-hmm. We would let them in for that. Yeah. But this, no. That'd be amazing. No. You, you got you to work harder. Adam, it looks like you have a result for us. Yeah, the one that comes up is a, it's not a real one, but yeah. it's called the Whisper Gold. Mm-hmm. Of course, but, it's got gold in it. Yeah, it's uh, gimmicky, though, because they release it as a gold cover chocolate bar, and it's sold for $1,600, a chocolate oh, bar. Oh, okay. So it's a little gimmicky. Mm. The one so they just really stole, like, one bite of that chocolate yeah. bar. Uh, and then the, the real one uh, that went bankrupt a few years ago was $854 a pound for chocolate. Huh. It was the most expensive candy Okay. On this Wow. wow! Good job. Okay. Way to way nice. to get us some actual eight hundred and fifty dollars a pound. So this could be just a pound of chocolate if they'd gone to the right place. But. I want I want someone to figure out, uh, dear listeners, this is your job. How much does eight hundred dollars worth of Smarties weigh, <laughs> or eight hundred dollars worth of licorice? Okay. I want to know what these guys were packing when they left. 
Because it just seems to me like it would be too much to conveniently hold. But anyway, whatever. All right. Well, what are we talking about today, Dan? <laughs> you you pitched this one. I, I, I pitched did. Ted Lasso. I know. You wanted mm-hmm. to talk about the fun show that everyone loves. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk about uh, my depression and anxiety. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, last year Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with depression and then earlier this year it got bad enough that I had to stop ignoring it because that was my initial reaction Mm -hmm. was, eh, sure, whatever Mm -hmm. lady, I don't have depression. Uh, no, by March of this year, it was very clear, uh, that I had fairly severe depression, that I was not managing well in any way. How, like... How long do you think you've had depression? Is this like going back to <coughs> the 20s and stuff? Or have you been, is this uh I can, looking back on my life, now that I am able to identify what this feels like, depression and anxiety, I can find extremely isolated incidents of it throughout the last, let's say, 10 years. Okay. I don't think that that counts. Mm. I think that that's just... I had a really bad day. You're having depressive episodes rather than... Rather than depression itself. Mm -hmm. Um, The actual depression, I think, started in 2020. Okay, with the Um, COVID stuff? Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. I thought that it was going to be very easy to just work from home, because that's what I do anyway. Like, Mm -hmm. it shouldn't have been a huge change to my daily life. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, oh, wait, I've got six kids that I'm now homeschooling Mm -hmm. in addition to this. Um, and apparently my story is very common. The CDC announced earlier this, uh, I think just last month, that one in five U.S. adults now has depression. Huge mm-hmm. spike in depression over the last few years. Um, and so I think that that just happened to a lot of people. Um, in 2020, I would lose a day of work about once a week. Mm-hmm. And I just knew that I was not going to get anything done. I just felt absolutely nothing no like mine doesn't really manifest as sadness it's just emptiness Um, yeah completely there's nothing there and i don't care about anything uh which was actually this morning for a couple of hours as well um i wasn't even going to come into work today except i had to drive my daughter to work and i'm like okay fine so i'm glad i'm here Mm. (laughs) i feel great now um and that calmed down uh one of the things that helped me a lot actually was uh I, I started, that's when I started GMing professionally mm-hmm. and got all of this social interaction, all of this fun stuff that I got to do, um, telling stories, but in a way that drew energy from other people. Okay. Writing became very mm-hmm. difficult because I had to do it all myself, whereas running nine RPG campaigns was very easy because it was all interactive. I could get that energy from other people and then redirect it and use it and turn it into something. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, so it was like one bad day every, you know, two or three weeks, maybe at the most. And then earlier this year, I realized sometime in March, I haven't had a good day in a couple of weeks. It is just constant awfulness. And that's when I told my wife, we really need to do something about this. So, yeah. Yeah. So therapy? I'm in therapy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a psychiatrist. Um, It's, I'm on meds. I'm on fluoxetine, which is Prozac. Yep, it's what Emily takes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know that that she has, she's had depression for quite a while. Yep, since Um, her 20s. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's working well. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like uh, last week, um, Part of what's going on right now is that summer has completely disrupted my schedule because the kids are home again from school Mm -hmm. and I'm doing a million different things. I've already gone, I've I've run a writing retreat. I've gone camping a million times. Last week, because of the 4th of July, we had all of this uh, stuff going on. And Friday morning, you know, after having done a full week of events and family things and friend things, uh, I woke up Friday morning and was like, oh, now I have to drive down to St. George. And was just, it was the worst depression I've ever felt. And at one point when my wife was driving, she started trying to find an address on her phone. And I thought, oh, she's not paying attention. She's going to roll the car. And I thought, oh, that'd be nice. And that was the first time I've ever experienced what's called passive suicidal ideation. Mm-hmm. I don't want to hurt myself. 
But if something bad happened in that moment, I would have been totally fine with it. Like I remember thinking, I wonder how long I could pretend to be unconscious in my chair before I would have to get up and help the kids. Like that's a horrible thing to think. Obviously, I would want to get up and help my family immediately. But in that moment, there was just nothing, no emotion, no hope, no ability to act. And I was just like, oh, yeah, it'd be so nice if this car rolled. Mm. And I've got three kids with depression. Uh, my oldest son, who's my second kid, my oldest daughter has depression and anxiety and some other things. Uh, my son, who's uh, she's 21, my son is 20, uh, he has uh, bipolar disorder, um, you know, very literally psychotic. He's doing great now. He's incredibly stable. Uh, but, you know, I spent four years of my life basically just trying to keep him alive long enough to be an adult. Um, and so now I am able to understand my kids in a way that I haven't before. And that's the one kind of upside to this. My brother also, he has depression, he has OCD, he has schizophrenia. He's He's an absolute just pinata of yeah, he got the grab bag. mental conditions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one thing that he told me is, you know, as bad as OCD is, as bad as schizophrenia is, he would take them any day over depression. And now I know what he means. <laughs> like, I can handle the anxiety so much better than the depression. It is wild. And the anxiety is rough. Uh, last night, I was playing a game with my son, uh, the the one who's 20. He lives in Cedar City. And so we were just playing League of Legends online, talking over Discord. And I was shaking, like physically shaking. I could barely play. I could barely touch the keys on the keyboard. Um, And that still is better than feeling absolutely nothing. But, wow. Fluoxetine famously takes a long time to kind of get into your system and manifest. Yeah. Uh, what have the doctors said? Like you started it, like I started like, it back in April, yeah. so it's been oh, okay. a few months. Um, it was kind of working for a while. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's not working great. Uh, I also have gabapentin, which is the on-demand. I'm feeling anxious. Take this. Yeah. Uh, I had hydroxazine for the same purpose. That did mm-hmm. absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. The gabapentin, I think, works a little bit, but it's very subtle. Um, so it might be that they're the wrong meds. It might be that they're the wrong doses. There's actually a, um, that you can take genetic tests. Uh, has, has Emily done this or have no, you done this with any of your kids? No, they just did this, uh, with one of my kids. The okay. first one. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a newer thing. And mm-hmm. so they can do a genetic test and see how you'll react probably yeah. to certain medications. How you are likely to respond, which ones you'll metabolize better yeah. or worse. Mm-hmm. Um, fluoxetine is apparently one of the ones that works well for me, mm-hmm. but... Uh, fluoxetine, for example, is an SSRI, and it might be that I need an SNRI because mm-hmm. the norepinephrine is also problematic. That's the next question I'm going to ask the psychiatrist is, what do you think about this? Uh, is cognitive behavioral therapy helpful for you? Are you try- Have you been learning that? Or? Um, no. Uh, the, the, I mean, not by that name. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not entirely certain what that is. What is okay. that? Okay, so this is the one thing that... Therapy-wise, has helped Emily the most. Okay. Um, so Emily, her story, she doesn't mind me sharing. She shares it quite openly. Mm-hmm. Um, was um, in her 20s. Uh, she was, um, you know, at college, and something just snapped, and mm-hmm. she had never really felt depression before, and then lost a year, basically, yeah. Um, to and her family, nobody in her family really had experience with this. You know, it's all these parents of ours that are pioneer ancestry, uh, just soldier through it sort of thing. And they were they were empathetic, but they had mm-hmm. no experience yeah. with this. Um, and uh, Emily went on the fluoxetine, and it works very well for her. That's good um, to hear. I mean, she still has a bad uh, has bad periods. Do you know what her dosage is? Uh, she's pretty high. Um, so what? What's? Yeah. I'm on sixty milligrams, okay. which is little. Little. We started me on twenty, and we yeah. built up to sixty, and I'm still not really. I feel like she's not I, really working. I won't say because I don't want to say anything okay. irresponsible. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I know she's on a pretty high, and she will go higher in the winters. 
and okay. then down with for the seasonal summers. Yeah. affective disorder. Um, and so, but the other thing that helped her was what uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the countering the bad thoughts with immediate rejections of them. Mm. Um, like not entertaining them, but kind of basically turning uh, a shield against them and saying, no, this is a lie. This is a cognitive distortion that my brain is telling me. Mm. Um, but her depression often manifests in the um, spiraling out of control in the how terrible things are and how they will be, mm. right? Mm -hmm. It's less the emptiness and more the, oh, you know, uh, Brandon just, you know, snored. Uh, he's dying. He's yeah. choking to death. He will choke to death and then the company will collapse. Our children will hate me because I'll be a bad mom because I'm try I'm grieving over my husband's death. They mm -hmm. will get into drugs and die. Yeah. Uh, like, and it just, that's... All from just one snore. All from one snore. Yeah. Um, is, and so the, the two ways she deals with that is number one, anti-journaling. She writes mm -hmm. it all down to see how silly it is. Yeah. And number two is cognitive behavioral therapy. No, snore does not mean this. No, don't go down that path. Stop right here. Uh, ask someone if it's r rational what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, talk it through with them and say, have you know, yeah. Yeah. And uh, there are people out there listening to this who have mm -hmm. never experienced depression or anxiety or anything like this. Yeah. And, and they're struggling to believe that this is real. Mm -hmm. And there are people out there who are like, yep, I do that all the time. That, that is such a familiar story to me. Uh, and this is this is the reality that so many people have. Um, one in five, like I said, CD, CDC predicts one in five American adults have depression. Mm -hmm. uh, they predict one in three American adults has some kind of mental illness. And people like to bring up, well, that doesn't that sound seem high, and things like that. Uh, would our, do our bodies? Uh, really work that poorly to which my response is what percentage of, uh, of americans need glasses yeah or um, have heart disease which or is have still the disease. number one killer yeah. um us. our bodies work fantastically well for what they are mm -hmm. but the you can point to the fact that our eyes statistically don't work that well yeah uh and glasses will help them and loxetine is glasses for a different part of your body Mm -hmm. uh, so to speak. Um, Basically, the whole history of human civilization yeah. is us f using tools to improve our ability to yes. survive in the world, right? Everything mm -hmm. that we have is something that makes us faster or stronger or smarter or yes. improves our memory or improves our vision or anything else. And that's what these meds are. They're, they're as real as a more visible disease. There's, a, there's an episode of South Park that I hate. <laughs> okay. Um, I actually, I, I, I have this sort of, like, I don't watch a lot of South Park anymore, but when it was first on, we watched it all the time. They are evil geniuses. Um, I think they do a lot mm -hmm. of really interesting You're things. You're actually the one who introduced me to South yeah. Park back in the um, day. Me and Ryan and so Dreyer from Bridge Four mm -hmm. uh, would, uh, would watch it and things like that. But there's one episode that I just, you know, you're, when the way that they make shows is they mm -hmm. just have to do it really fast with the writer's room, lots of improv, and then go to press. Yeah. Doing that, you're occasionally going to just get something dead wrong. Mm -hmm. And they have an episode about ADHD. That's just completely wrong. That is just, just not just completely wrong. It's like, it stayed with me because, um, you know, they do the kind of standard joke of kids these days have ADHD. We have a revolutionary, you know, like the kids have ADHD, so they get prescribed drugs mm -hmm. and the drugs just turn them into like, the joke is, which is actually a pretty funny joke. They, they take ADHD meds and they all decide they like Phil Collins music. <laughs> okay. Right, because it's like how lame Phil Collins is, that right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is again kind of funny. Um, but um, the they take it and it turns them into zombies, basically. And then the parents are like worried about them, so they watch this like guys like I have a, a a revolutionary way to deal with ADHD, and it shows three kids like hopping up and down in chairs. And he goes to the first one and says, "Do your homework," and yells at them, and like sit down and shut up. And the kid starts crying but then opens his book and starts doing his homework. He goes to the next one and yells at him, and then the third one just opens up their book and starts doing their homework. Mm. The going back to the old thing that if yeah. you just stick it up. That if you just yell at your you kids enough. yell at your kids or yell at yourself, uh, if, you have, if you have a mental illness, just, you know, just, mm -hmm. just stop being sad. 
Yeah. Um, you know, if someone were just, you know, able to tell you as it is, and, you know, meanwhile, I now have a kid with ADHD, and the medicine does not turn him into a zombie. The medicine is life-saving yeah. for his ability to actually interact with function in the and world. Function. And it's really interesting. If you hold Dallin, he is always, he's got like one of these, what do you call them? The twitches that are mm -hmm. just like he. It, it, the restless leg syndrome yeah, for his whole his body. Yeah, but his whole body, just constantly. Um, and like the, the drugs are a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't turn him into a zombie. They turn him into the him that he had been before this got out of control. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we have this this problem in our society that the answer is not go seek help. It is soldier through. Stick it up. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a local author. I won't say his name because I don't know how public he's being about this. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I talked to him at FanX, which is Salt Lake's Comic-Con, last year. Hadn't seen him, you know, for the three years of COVID. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we used to talk all the time. And then I got to see him again, catching up. And he was diagnosed with ADHD, mm -hmm. like in 2020 or something. And he said that it was just a life-changing thing. Being on meds now so that his brain can concentrate and focus on stuff. Mm -hmm. He'd written something like eight or nine books in his entire career. And then over the last... Uh, just two or three years, he's written 11 because his brain works now. Uh, and it's, it's, it's such an amazing thing to see. And I thought that I had understood it. Having dealt mm -hmm. with my brother, having dealt with my, my kids, I thought that I knew what they were going through. And now that I am seeing it from the inside, it is night and day different. And so I guess more than anything else, I wanted to talk about this on an episode because admitting that something was wrong and seeking help for it was really hard for me to do uh but is really helping i'm still in the throes of it uh, i got basically nothing done today i read several chapters of frugal wizard and said that counts as work i mean you went to <laughs> meetings i went to meetings and you recorded three and episodes. i recorded podcasts yeah uh, so. i didn't write a single word however uh, so I'm still struggling with that. But please, you out there, if you're listening to this and you know you have a problem or you think you might have a problem, please reach out to somebody mm -hmm. uh, because this is incredibly real. It is as real as a tumor and invisible. And there's people in your life that don't believe it's true. There's people in your life that think you're making it up. Um, but if it's if it's real, please get help for it. Yeah. I mean, the the way our society interacts with mental health is, even today, like, we, uh, more people are talking about it, more shows. Mm -hmm. Ted Lasso has been yeah. talking about it and things. It's, it is still something that we just it's still don't. such a stigma. Yeah. Um, this, when I started writing uh, John Cleaver and Hollow City, which mm -hmm. are my books specifically about uh, abnormal psychology, um, it was true at that time, so mm -hmm. like early 2000s, that in the United States, a person with mental illness was more likely to be in prison than in therapy. Yep. Um, which doesn't mean that everyone is in prison, because like I said, it's, it's you know, one in five, one in three people. Uh, but more likely to be in prison than in therapy. Uh, we have a history of either demonizing mental illness or of canonizing it. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at television, people with mental illness on television are 20 times more likely to be depicted as violent than someone without a mental illness, which is actually the opposite of the real life statistics. So yeah. we, we have this way of demonizing it. And then on the other side, you've got things like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, where the whole message of the show is, they're not sick, they just think differently than we do, and we should accept them. And that's incredibly harmful to our ability to understand that these are actual illnesses. So... In its defense, there is a dividing line there with some things like the autism spectrum and whatnot, mm -hmm. where the science is coming down on, you know what, understand and interact like that it is not an illness. Yeah. Um, right. So there, but there is a fuzzy line there. there. It is. And one of the things about it is, and this was really key to me understanding way back in my abnormal psych class mm -hmm. in college, the teacher said, 
the definition of, of abnormal psych is defined by the individual and how much their psychology interferes with the life they want to live. Exactly. Yes. Something is not a disorder mm -hmm. unless it disrupts your life in some way. Yes. And this is one thing that my daughter and my, uh, my wife argue about sometimes. My daughter is convinced that my wife has ADD. Mm -hmm. And she might have some elements of that, mm -hmm. but she functions flawlessly. <coughs> and so it is not a disorder. She mm -hmm. might have attention deficit, but she mm -hmm. does not have attention deficit disorder. Uh, and that is true across the spectrum. And so that's a, that's a good point to make. When, mm -hmm. when we're talking about something that one in three adults has a mental illness, it might not be an illness at that point. It might just be a different way of living. And we do need to be cautious about the way we talk about them and the way that we treat everybody. So, But um, that said... A lot of this is definitely an illness, and you should seek yes. treatment and take care of yourself. Uh, and if you need help, reach out to someone, please. I am um, not to get too. I will leave off names and things like this, but I knew an individual one time who um, his family was one of these families that just didn't believe mental illness was mm -hmm. a thing, particularly not for their family. Yeah. Uh, and so this individual was raised in such a way that. I mean, they had very kind of obvious depression to everyone from the outside. The, I can't get out of bed today, I can't, mm -hmm. you know, which is absolutely disrupting their life. Uh, failing out of classes over and over again, despite really wanting to, mm -hmm. uh, and things like this. And because of the family pressure, they couldn't seek help for this. Um, the, the help that they would get would be related to um, certain um, certain practices that involved, uh, you know, mysticism, basically, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the the kind of modern day mysticism where you go to a doctor who has um, some little process where they, you know, they they help you to release, you know, the bad chakra or whatever, mm -hmm. um, and things like that, and it was just debilitating. This individual would never get help. They would go to the doctor and the doctor would release the bad memories from their body. Uh, yeah. And then they would go and still have depression because, oh, depression, our family doesn't have depression. Mm -hmm. um, you so, don't admit it. Yeah, yeah my, uh, my daughter's girlfriend, mm -hmm. uh, her family is like that. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not giving any identifying details here. Uh, but yeah, she is actually not in therapy or medicated mm -hmm. because her family doesn't think it's real and won't pay for any of it. And so she can't even like, even though she's away from home and in college, mm -hmm. uh, she's still on her parents' insurance and she can't go seek something out because if they see that on the insurance, they'll freak out and it'll be a whole thing. Mm -hmm. And that's it's a terrible way to live. Um, and I will say that I do do some kind of woo-woo stuff, not mysticism necessarily, but like mm -hmm. I do a lot of uh, yoga breathing techniques I think that help that, me through anxiety yeah. attacks so well. That is definitely not what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. I know mm -hmm. you're talking about the much more crazy stuff. And, and in Utah, we do have a fair amount of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, some of those things can still be really good. I do meditation. I do breathing exercises. In addition to therapy and drugs yeah i from what i've read and researched i would recommend meditation to anyone who mm -hmm. um, do you do meditation so i do not okay i have tried meditation um i am not happy meditating because i am not writing stories okay that makes sense right <laughs> you'd uh, rather tell a story to yourself i'd rather tell a story to myself do you ever find um that that is therapeutic in oh yeah way? absolutely yeah um you right? work out issues while telling stories yeah. about them i mean that's how i explore the world that's mm -hmm. how i even all, all these bad story ideas on our podcast is me telling a story to myself uh, exploring the world. Yeah. Um, a lot of the bad stories we can't get into because I just take a movie and say, ah, oh, they, they, what if this went the other way? Right. Like that's mm -hmm. a lot of my, yeah. um, my bad stories. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll try to bring some of those. I had one the other day. I'm trying to remember <laughs> what it was. It was a really good one. Uh, but, uh, it was directly based off of a media property. 
Um, and but I I really like thinking through stories and their part logic problem, part exploration of the world, part meditation. But it's mm -hmm. not meditation because to actually meditate, which I have done, you do need to clear your mind. And it's, yeah. it's the ideas about thinking about nothing is the point. Mm -hmm. And it's not a not a not a thing that I enjoy. Yeah, um, yeah that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But you have a different thing that does work for you. So yes, that's very good. Mm -hmm. Well, awesome. Cool. Well, um, thanks for doing this weird episode. <laughs> thanks for taking part in our therapy session. <laughs> yes. Uh, we'll be back next week with nonsense instead. Absolute nonsense. How's that, Ben? <laughs>